Hello everyone, welcome back to lecture 7 of CPC by Dhruti Bhairia. In today's class, we'll be covering interest, cost, discovery, inspection and production of documents, interim orders, order 23 and order 22. In the previous class, we had covered some very important concepts of first hearing, trial, judgment and decree. Now I understand that today's lecture would also be covering a wide range of topics. So this lecture also might be a little lengthy. However, we'll try to ensure that we can complete all the uh, topics properly and within time limit. If the time does not permit, we might leave out some topics for today and do it in the next lecture. So starting with today's topic, but before that, uh, I have to uh, mention something that in the last class when we were doing order 16, that is summons to witnesses, in that portion I had missed out section 31 and 32. Please also go through that when you are reading order 16. Now for today's topic, first we'll start with interest and then we'll go to cost. These are very short topics and we'll start with that. So interest has been dealt under section 34 of the code. And this as specifically, there's no such definition of what is interest, but you can understand it as a charge which is paid for borrowing money. Now interest can be of three kinds. One that is interest, which is for the period prior to the filing of the suit. Second, which is for the pen, uh, pendency of the litigation. And the third from the date of decree to the date of payment. Mostly here we are dealing in section 34 is about the third one. So whenever in any decree where there is a payment of money, if the court is feeling that it is reasonable, then it may award a certain interest on the principal amount. And this may also include the interest which was existing prior to the institution of the suit. Now this interest rate will not exceed 6% per annum and it will be from the date of decree to the date of payment or any other earlier date as the court thinks fit. Now section 34 is also giving us a proviso that if it is a commercial transaction then that 6% ceiling can be exceeded but the upper limit is the lim uh, rates at which the nationalized banks are uh, giving money out in the uh, market. Now one important concept when we are dealing with interest is that if the decree is silent in respect of payment of further interest then the court shall deem to have refused the same and no separate suit will lie for the same. Here you can go back and see under rest judicata the explanations that where if there is no if the court has not expressly dealt with something then it is always deemed to have been refused. So this is the first topic that we have covered that is interest. Now moving on to the next topic. Now cost. Costs, uh, what are costs? Now costs are also something which is under the discretion of the court and these are the certain provisions under which costs are covered in the court. General costs under section 35, miscellaneous costs, order 20A, compensatory costs for false and vexatious claims and defenses, section 35A and costs for causing delay, section 35B. So section 35 which is dealing with general costs states that now it is the court's discretion and it will based on legal principles, it will think what is just, equitable, etc. And it will give out from whom it has to be taken, from what property you have to give cost, what extent is needed, whatever directions that is needed. And on considering the case and its circumstances, the court will award costs. Now, generally, if any event, uh, if any event happens, costs does follow and whoever is a successful party is entitled to it. However, there are situations when it may be even be payable by a certain party who has done some misconduct. Like for example, the court is continuously giving you time to produce a certain document. You're not doing so, you're causing the delay of the cost. Later on, you come with the document, the court might not allow you to uh, 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 may not allow you to produce a document or put, uh, put the document on record, but it may allow you to do so with cost. Here, because you have done something wrong, so certain penalty is being imposed on you. And the general rule is that costs follow events. Any event that has taken place, there will be some cost. And if the court is not awarding cost, then the court has to give reasons in writing for the same. Now, what are miscellaneous costs under Order 20A? Now, there, if you read Order 20A, I have not dealt with the rules in specific. There are specific costs in relation to what would be, uh, that the court can award costs for inspection of records, for the typing and writing of pleadings, for the summons costs, for the uh, serve notice, etc. So that is dealt in Order 20A. Now, Section 35A is a compensatory cost for false and vexatious claims or defenses. Now, here, if in a suit or any proceeding including execution 
we have to remember this because in appeal and revision section 35a will find no applicability so if any party is objecting to a claim or any defense that has been made as false or vexatious and the same is disallowed or abandoned or withdrawn in whole or part and the court if it thinks fit that yes this was a, a, of such a nature that costs need to be awarded the court will record a statement to that effect and order for the payment of cost the maximum amount that can be awarded under section 35a is rupees 3000 however you may feel that this amount is so meager but this is not an exemption for criminal liability in respect of this same and this so amount can also be considered in any other subsequent suit that the person is filing for damages or compensation. So 35A is just giving you a small safeguard that if you do not want to go for a separate suit for damages or compensation or want to go for criminal liability under the code also for a maximum amount of rupees 3000 in cases of false or vexatious claims or defenses you can do so. Here it is important to remember that uh, 35A has no applicability in appeals and revision. However, in execution, 35A is applicable. Now, the next uh, cost uh, provision is under section 35B, which is cost for causing delay. So, if a first party is failing to take a step that he is required to take, or he was taking an adjournment and he is failing to do so, like producing evidence, etc., court may ask reasons, court may uh, not ask reasons, may record reasons, and they may ask for payment of cost that will be sufficient to reimburse the other party for the expense that they had incurred for attending the court on that particular day. So you had failed to bring the document on that day, but the other party did appear. So that cost will be given to that person, the other party that, okay, you had come on that day, no work was done. So this is why we are working with this cost. And this payment may become a condition precedent for further prosecution of suit by the plaintiff of the defense of the defendant. So whoever is, was at fault for causing delay, he has to first pay these costs, then only if he is a plaintiff, then the prosecution of suit will be allowed, or if he is a defendant, then his defense will be allowed. However, whenever these costs are being awarded, the court will first see whether the delay was due to avoidable reasons or not. So this covers interests and costs. These are important concepts that also need to be read, uh, that need to be read with judgment and decree, because obviously a judgment and decree will have the uh, uh, will have the statements in relation to whether any interest is record, uh, awarded or not, whether any costs have been awarded or not. This is why you mostly need to read it with judgment and decree. Now moving on to the next topic that is discovery, inspection and production of documents. Now uh, in the, till the last class we were dealing with the assumption that whatever pleadings have been submitted by the parties when the parties have appeared before the court, the pleadings sufficiently disclose all the materials, facts or documents. And they are relating only to facts and not evidence. However, there may be situ situations where the pleadings are not sufficiently disclosing all the material facts or documents. In that situation, what we will do? We will go for discovery, inspection, and production of documents. So there are various orders like order 11, which talks about discovery and inspection, order 12, which deals about admissions, order 13, which deals about production, impounding and return of documents, and order 19 deals with affidavits. So first we'll do this uh, order 11, that is discovery and inspection. So what is discovery? Here you are compelling the opposite party to disclose whatever he has in possession of her. Now, why are we doing so? Because whatever information he has, uh, whatever there are certain information or facts that is required by the other party to also know. Now, what the other party will do, they will set, put up a set of questions which will, uh, which are known as integratories. Judges will go through the questions. If they think proper, they may make the other party answer them and oath before trial. Now, order 11 is the relevant order as we have seen. Here it is done, but whenever you need more information from the party, it can be taken. Now, why do we do so? So that you can object here is, you know the other party's case, you can uh, support your own case directly by if he is making any admissions or indirectly by whatever he is stating in his case, you can use it indirectly. And here in an integratory, it may not be directly related to the facts in issue. It is enough, it is related to the matters in issue, indirectly or indirectly related. However, by use of interrogatories, you are not allowed to try to know the evidence of the other party or any con confidential or privileged communications or any questions of law or merely just trying to fish in nature that, okay, let's try, maybe we'll just get something. 
So here under this order, there are two types of discovery, one for the interrogatories and then for the discovery of documents. So interrogatories, the relevant rules are on rule one and 11. Now, what are integratories? What are we doing? In any suit, any of the party can take the court sleeve. In writing, they will uh, give the set of questions to the opposite party. And if there are more parties, then they under each under each integratory, they'll write that this particular question, I want this particular uh, defendant to answer or this particular party to answer. And if it is not related to matters in question, then the, those questions can be deemed irrelevant by the court. Now, rule two is telling how do you, what happens when you are presenting an application for integratories, the court has to decide within seven days. And within seven days, it has also to take into account the offer of admissions, delivering of documents or anything, etc. And only then will it allow such integratories, the leave for such integratories, if it feels it is necessary for fair disposal of the case. Now what rule three, very natural logical sequence. If the court is finding that it is unreasonable, vexatious, improper questions, then whoever had asked it or whoever is at fault, that person will be imposed cost to cost. Rule number six is telling you that yes, obviously it is because I have a right to ask questions doesn't mean that I can ask anything. So if there's certain questions that have asked you, which you feel is scandalous, irrelevant, not bona fide, or they are materials which are not sufficiently material or they are protected by privilege then you can take down those questions put it in your answer and affidavit that i object to such and such questions now rule number seven very just think like is it that i have an absolute right to ask anything no i i would not have an absolute right to ask anything so for any unreasonable vexatious oppressive scandalous etc type of question uh, interrogatories that have been made i can make an application the same can be set aside and struck out now rule number eight is telling me that if i have given you if i have given you an interrogatory then what is the time limit in which you are to reply back to it the affidavit in answer to that interrogatory should be given within 10 days or in the time allowed by the court and rule 10 says that if an interrogatory has been given to you, there is no exception to be taken and uh, to uh, be taken and whatever you have answered, whether it is sufficient or not, will be deemed by the court. Now, rule 11 is also saying that, for example, now I've given you certain questions, now you have answered. So whether you have answered properly or whether you have not at all answered. If I see that you, if the court has seen that there, there is an omission to answer a particular question or there is an insufficient answer for a particular question, party may apply to a court requiring him to answer again. And then you can answer either by affidavit or by a waiver words. Then you can see rule 5, 4, and 9, and 23, what in the case of interrogatories for a corporation, 23 for minors, etc. Now, rule number 22, the next important rule that is saying that how do we use these answers to interrogatories in interrogatories in trial? Now, any party, not it doesn't matter who, may use that particular answers that have been given in evidence, either use it in part or in ans or all of it without using the rest. Now, here in such a situation, court will, however, look that by breaking in in part, whether, whether I am trying to uh, make a disconnect between the actual answer and what I'm trying to inform. Maybe what state I am, uh, like for example, I gave you an answer in one paragraph. In one line, I was stating something, trying uh, something on the lines which made it seem that I'm accepting your contentions. And you just took that line and tried to misrepresent it. However, the court will say that no, that entire paragraph has to be read as a whole because that the meaning of the sentence cannot be derived by it on its own. It has to be read in accordance with the entire paragraphs. So this is rule 22. Now this was where we were seeing interrogatories, rule number one to 11. Here where you are trying to get uh, facts from the other parties, etc. Now the next topic that we move on to is discovery of documents. Now in discovery of documents, now it can be for the documents which you have recorded in your pleadings or affidavits but you have not annexed so or those which you have not. Now rule number 12 first states that that any of the parties with may without filing any affidavit apply to the court for order of discovery of documents which are in possession and are relevant to any question. 
and the court can adjourn or refuse it if it feels it is not necessary. Same in the similar manner, court will obviously, as a discretion, feels that it is not necessary or unnecessarily applying for a document which is not relevant. Then it will not allow uh, uh, to do so. It will only allow if it feels that fair, fair disposal of the suit or for saving costs, etc., it is required. Now, rule number thirty. Now uh, you have to place an affidavit, whatever list of documents that you have to produce, and and what are the documents? But the, the, if I have applied for discovery of documents and you have got that particular, the court has ordered that yes, okay, produce these particular documents. Now you have certain objections to the same. You have to name down those documents in, on an affidavit and tell that you object to the production of the same documents. Now rule number 14 says that uh, it, for, it is lawful for the court that during the product pendency of a suit, it may order production of any party on oath of any such document that he is having in his possession or under his power, which it feels that is important for determining the question in the suit. So here the court also has power to do call for such documents. Then we move on to rule number 15. Rule number 15 says that what, how would you inspection of documents which are mentioned in the pleadings or affidavit. Now every party is entitled at or before the settlement of issues that will give a notice to a party who has mentioned such and such document. Like I mentioned a certain document, not produced it. So the other party can do so is that I can uh, give notice to me and say that I want to either you give me a copy of the same, either you allow me to inspect it or you let me take copies or let, give me the, the same document. And if that particular party, if you have given me that notice that I want to see what document you're relying upon to, uh, what, what document that you have referred, I want to inspect that, I want a copy of it, and I do not do so, then the court may not allow me to use a document in evidence unless the court is satisfied that it is related to my title or I have sufficient cause for not complying with the notice. Now the next thing saying is that time for inspection when notice given. Now if such notice is given, then within 10 days I have to deliver a notice back to you if you have given me notice that I want to inspect so and so documents. Within 10 days I have to give you it back stating the time and place where you can come and produce, uh, where you can come and inspect the document or you can produce. So if it is books or accounts, etc., then obviously it will be at the usual place of business. And then you will also state, then I will also state on the affidavit that, okay, but these particular documents I object to producing, I do not want to show you. Now, if rule order, uh, uh, rule number 18 says that if there's an order of inspection, now, if there's an order of inspection where you, uh, I gave you, I did not, for, uh, you gave me a notice, I did not give you a notice back fixing the date and time, then the court may also make an order that no, you have to within such and such time, you have to do so. And if it is a particular document, as I already told, the documents may be mentioned in the pleadings to the affidavits, or it may not be. So if it is already mentioned, if it is not mentioned in the pleadings, party can only produce when it is applying to the court with affidavit by saying that yes, even though this was not mentioned by the other party in their pleadings, it is very essential for this case. Now, rule number 19 is saying that if it is uh, dealing with uh, business books, etc., instead of ordering copies, uh, instead of ordering the production, etc., what you'll do is that, uh, or ordering copies to be given, if there can be a verification from the person who exam has examined the copy with the original entries that yes, I had seen so, if there's omission, etc., he'll mention all of it, and this can be given. So verified copies, instead of inspection, a verification on affidavit by person can also be given. However, the court also has found that despite this, it can also order for an inspection, despite such verified copy, they can order for inspection. And if somebody is claiming privilege in respect of a particular document, the court has the right to inspect the document to see whether actually that privilege exists or not, unless it relates to matters of the state. Now, the next thing is that rule number 20, which deals with premature discovery. 
where the court premature discovery means where the court is feeling that okay this particular disco, uh, this particular uh, discovery of a document or inspection of a document depends on determination of a, some other question or issue which so first what we'll do it will postpone that discovery or inspection process first determine that very issue like whether this document is protected by privilege or not or etc that it should be determined if it feels it is not protected by uh, uh, privilege then it can auto for discovery or inspection and rule number 21 is an important rule which says what in the case of non-compliance with an order of discovery now if the person is a plaintiff he is not complying with the order of a discovery etc then the suit may be dismissed and if it is a defendant the defense may be struck out as if he has never defended the case and the party whoever is seeking that an order under rule 21 should be made that for non-compliance either the suit is dismissed or the defense is struck out he'll apply court will hear both the sides and decide here now here an important thing is that if a, if a suit is dismissed under rule 21 then no fresh suit lies here your then important thing is that whenever there is a dismissal of suit happening you always need to remember in which circumstances fresh suit can be brought and in which cannot be brought and rule 21 is not something that the courts will use very easily and at the whim at their whims and fancies it should always be the last resort they'll try their best that this situation of ordering under rule or uh, rule 21 doesn't come so moving on to the next order that is admissions now admissions what are there is that if you have admitting a fact then obviously you do not need to prove the same according to section 58 of the evidence act now admissions when can you make them you can make them before the filing of the suit or after the filing of the suit so one automatic thing if you are admitting something no need to prove it admissions then the need of proving will go away now there are various provisions uh, see that now moving on to the order that deals with admissions. Now rule one says that any parties may by notice by either in his pleading or in writing may admit a part or whole of the claim. Very simple. That is how you can do it either by ple uh, pleading or in writing or by notice. In writing by notice. Second, now if he is admitting certain documents, either party within if you are trying to admit certain documents and either party within seven days of the date of notice of any document may call upon to admit on the genuineness of the documents now rule 2a is saying the document will be deemed to be admitted if it is not denied expressly or implied after service of notice to admit document so if you have not expressly denied or impliedly denied that you have been given a notice to admit a document and you do not do so then it will be deemed that it has been admitted however this will not be done against a party who is laboring under a legal disability now uh, court may also allow proving of such uh, documents the genuineness of such documents otherwise than admission and if it feels so it may also record reasons now, court may also order co uh, compensation if it feels that there was reasonable, unreasonable neglect or refusal in admitting the documents. Now, Rule 3A then moves on that court can record admission if there was no notice under Rule 2, then court on its own notion at any stage of the proceedings can call a party to admit a document. Rule 4 is stating that notice to admit facts or facts, then any party by notice in writing at any time not later than eight days before the date fixed of hearing can call the other party or any particular facts which are mentioned in a document So moving on to the next topic that is admissions under order 12. So basic funda behind this order is that if you're admitting a particular fact, you do not need to prove it. Now, how do you do so? Under rule one, it is saying that by notice in writing or by pleadings, a particular party can admit a, in part or whole of the claim. Now rule two states that if a notice is given, 
to admit certain documents and either party can do so and within seven days of the date of notice of any document you may be called upon to admit the genuineness of the document and the rule 2a states that if you had been service to notice to admit a document and you are not expressly denying it or impliedly denying it then it is taken that it is deemed to be admitted it is uh, however for a person laboring under a legal disability it is not expressly deemed so there you are given chances however the court may also allow proving otherwise than an admission if it feels that no admission is not enough and it needs other reasons and court may has also the power to order compensation if it feels there is unreasonable neglect or refusal in admitting the documents the next rule that we see is that that the power the court has a power to record an admission where there is no notice under rule 2 then court on its own motion at any point or at any point or stage in the proceedings will call a party to admit a document now when the notice to admit facts or by any of the parties can be given for not at a time not later than 9 days before the date fixed for hearing the other party will be called for for admitting certain facts that are mentioned in the document and if you are not admitting the same or in time allowed for the same then the cost of proving will be made by the party cost of proving such facts will be paid by the party who has neglected or refused to do the same and then moving on to rule 6 which says that judgments on admission which have been made in any pleading or otherwise in oral or in writing at any stage then the court on its own or an application of either parties without waiting for any other determination to take place can make such order or a judgment and if such a judgment is given obviously a decree will be ordered ordered and rule 7 is dealing with the affidavit of signature such signature is sufficient evidence of the admissions if it is required and cost if notice to produce or admit uh, documents has been given and which are not necessary which was not required then the cost will be borne by the parties who gave such a notice so this was all about admissions the next topic of order 13 production impounding and return of documents i feel that can be seen on their own that is why i have not dealt here please go through it if there are any problems please let me know we can discuss it in a later class now the next topic that comes is affidavits which are dealt in order 19 now affidavits as we had already uh, done before are declaration of facts which are reduced to writing which are affirmed or sworn before an officer who has an authority to administer oaths they are always made in first person they contain statement and not inferences now rule 1 under order 19 states that the court has power to prove order any point to be proved by an affidavit if it feels that there is a particular fact that needs to be proved by an affidavit it may order the same or if it feels that on affidavit a witness has to be heard on whatever conditions the court feels so it can do so and it feels that either party bona fide if it desires uh, if it desires that uh, a production of a witness for the purposes of cross examination and that particular person can be produced in that case you do not need to bring an affidavit of that particular witness now rule 2 states that the power to order attendance of deponent for cross examination if the evidence was given on an affidavit but on the instance of either parties they feel that no you that party needs to be in person and the court also feels the same then the person will personally that party has to appear unless he is exempted otherwise and rule 3 states what are the matters to which an affidavit should be confined to it should be only confined to those matters where the deponent has whole knowledge of the same except in the case of interlocutory orders where statements of beliefs are allowed where they are admitted provided you are giving the grounds why you have such a statement of belief and if any affidavit is containing unnecessarily hearsay or argumentative matter or co copies from documents etc without any serving any purpose then costs may also be awarded and that will be paid by the party who has filed the same so this portion that we dealt of affidavits order order 13 admissions under order 12 and discovery and inspection on the, under order 11 came under the head of discovery came under the head of discovery inspection and production of documents
comments. Now, be before moving on, I know we've covered a lot of things. That is why let's go back to it. Order 11 was dealing with discovery and inspection. What we were doing by discovery, we were trying to ask the opposite party to disclose whatever he had in its possession of ours. Then we saw that there were two types of interrogatories and the discovery of documents. We saw that you can deliver them in writing. The interrogatory should be in writing. There, there, uh, and within seven days, the court has also to decide on the same, and uh, uh, decide on the same. And it will take that whether and it will take other admissions, production of documents, etc. Costs can also be imposed if it is unreasonable, vexatious or improper. Objections can be taken. It can be struck out or uh, setting aside of such interrogatories may be taken. Affidavits and answers uh, will be given within 10 days. No exceptions has to be taken. Now, there may be order to answer or answer further also. And these how these interrogatories will be used in trial then we see how documents similarly we will see there were provisions for how documents were being used and how you were giving time for inspection if there is no inspection when you feel the inspection is not needed you can go for verified copies also you can go for uh, then what, what is the case where there'll be a premature discovery when you first decide an issue and then move on then what happens rule 21 when there's a non-compliance with the order of discovery so this was where we saw where we were dealing with interrogatories and discovery of documents now the next topic that we dealt was admissions admissions we know generally if there is if there is an admission you do not need to prove that fact so what would take place how uh, how are you admitting a particular fact when can we call for notice when that if you are not replying when it can be deemed whether the court has a power to record admission whether it can send a notice or not whether a judgment can be passed on such admissions or not after defeats on of signature costs can be imposed in respect of such things or not then order 13 as you have to see it on your own then what are the effects of an affidavit rule 3 under affidavits were showing you that what matters have to be uh, what matters should an uh, affidavit contain now uh, rule 1 was telling you that the court has far that a certain point can be proved by an affidavit and then it can also call for attendance of a deponent for a cross examination so this was where we are seeing respect of documents witnesses etc but the additional steps that can be taken by the court in ensuring that all the facts material facts documents come on record before the proceeding can continue this was dealing with discovery production and inspection of documents now the next thing that we'll move on to is interim orders now interim orders are what interim orders are what they are passed during the pendency of a suit they are not finally deciding the substantive rights and liabilities of the party and why are we doing so interim orders now we know that uh, after you have conclusively determined something or everything is finally decided, the court obviously gives a judgment order, decree, etc. However, there are certain situations where the court also needs to pass certain orders during dependency, where they need to deal with and protect the rights of the parties between the pendency. It helps. So these interim orders that are there, they enable the court to grant such relief or pass such orders whenever it feels the need that it is just or necessary or equitable that it needs to be done. So it is sort of a safeguard given to the courts that if you feel something is going away, even going uh, going very, something is going wrong. And you, even though you are in the pendency of that suit, you still have power to pass certain interim orders. Now the uh, interim orders that have been dealt under the court are under commissions, arrest and attachment before judgment, temporary injunctions, interlocutory orders, receiver, security for costs, payments in court, etc. Now over here, under because these are also a lot of topics, but the last three topics here we will not be doing in much detail. We, I'll just you you should go through them on their own. So and even commissions, we, you'll see how I've dealt with it so that it will be easier for you to understand. The main grasping the main portion you will be able to understand and less rest you can do on your own. So moving on to the next topic, that is interim orders. Now interim orders. Now, first we need to understand why there was a need to create these provisions for interim orders. Now, interim orders are those orders which the court is passing during the pendency of a suit. 
now we know that oats pass orders judgments degree after they have heard the entire thing and then they pass such a thing such an order etc however by interim orders courts have been empowered where they can grant relief when they feel that it is important to protect the rights of the parties or there is a need that may need to pass a certain order this order however does not determine finally the substantive rights and liabilities of the parties but they are essential so interim orders are essential because they deal with and protect the rights of the parties in the pendent during the pendency of the suit and here the court has enabled that the court can grant such relief or pass orders whatever it feels is just necessary or equitable now these are the particular interim orders that are dealt under the court In today's lecture we will however be only dealing with the first court uh, first uh, first topic third topic and the fourth topic uh, the rest you can do it on your own they are not very or complex or detailed as such and i feel by now you must be, you must have mustered the courage enough to actually go through the bear act on your own itself if you had did not have the courage before so and i do not think that they need these the, all those topics need to be dealt in that much detail that is why i am skipping them so now for the first thing that we are seeing is commissions now commissions have been dealt under section 75 and 78 and order 26 Now, firstly, Section seventy-five deals that the court has the power to issue commissions. Now, what are we doing by these commissions? That they are sending a set a group of people, or they are sending a particular person to do something. So, these six points are very important. What are commissions issued for? First, for examining any person. Second, for local investigation. Third, examining or adjusting accounts. Fourth, making a partition. and last is holding a scientific or a technical or expert investigation or conducting sale of a property which is subject to speedy and natural decay and lastly performing any ministerial act now you can see that i have mentioned the rule numbers also with the particular headings the reason why i have done so and i have not dealt with them in detail is that for example because it could have got quite long and maybe it will come too lengthy and i would have to dedicate half a class entirely to commissions that is why i did not do so so examination of any person like uh, try and think logically that if a person is in the same jurisdiction but he might be exempted for that person you the court can issue commissions so all the rules under rule 1 to 8 are specifying all the particulars that are needed to be followed while a commission is being sent for examining any person similarly for local investigation and all other things so the most important aspect is to remember section 75 that what are the purposes for which commissions are issued examining a person local investigation examining or adjusting accounts making a partition holding a scientific technical or expert investigation conducting sale of a property and performing of a ministerial act the next thing is section 76 where commission to another court which is which is in another state for the purposes of examination of a person is given here also that particular court will examine him commission will executed will return with whatever evidence they have collected and take it back to the court where it was ordered then section 77 is dealing with the letter of request where instead of commission a letter or request for examining a person residing at any place not within india is sent and section 78 is dealing with commission issued by a foreign court and rules 19 to 21 are the relevant rules here and in general rules 15 to 18 we deal with topics like what would who would be the expenses of the commission what are the powers of the commissioners and all these others aspects so this was commissions in the briefest uh, uh, manner possible section 75 is the most important section here in section 75 to 78 and order 26 when you are dealing when you are dealing with uh, writing commissions in respect of a main sansa obviously order 26 becomes important and you may have to uh, you may uh, you may need to uh, add on to these particular points with the help of the rules for example what should what is the procedure for issuing a commission for examining any person first you talk about section 75 and then also deal with rule 1 to 8 now moving on to the next topics that is temporary injunction order 39 which is dealt in rule 1 of 5 
So before moving to what are temporary injunctions, first we need to understand what are injunctions. So it is a judicial process where a party is either required to do something or refrain to do something. If it is required to do something, it is a mandatory injunction. If it is required to refrain from doing something, it is a prohibitory injunction. And what are temporary injunctions? Those injunctions which are issued during the pendency of a proceeding. Now, by this, we are seeing that it is a sort of interim relief. It is ensuring the preservation of property. It is ensuring that the status quo is preserved and no further change takes place. Injunctions can be of temporary or permanent type. Permanent injunctions have been dealt under sections 38 to 42 of Specific Relief Act. If you have studied Specific Relief Act, you would, would remember. And temporary injunctions have been dealt under Order 39. Now, injunction can be sought by either of the parties. It is not necessary that the plaintiff can only ask for injunction. Now, injunctions, again, are a matter of discretion. You cannot claim injunction as a matter of right. And before granting any injunction, these are the three points that any court will consider. First, the court will see whether you have a prima facie case or not. A prima facie case means the court will see whether there is a case which is fit for investigation and decision can be made or not. That is, whether there are chances that the plaintiff or whether the applicant might uh, might succeed in what he is asking for and by uh, giving evidence etc he might come to the conclusion that is there here it does not mean proving your case you are not required to prove your case you just need to show the likelihood that yes there are chances that i may succeed i have a case it requires adjudication it requires to be gone into depth Second point before granting injunction, the court has to see whether irreparable injury will be caused to the applicant or not. That if injunction is not granted, something, some sort of an injury will happen which cannot be repaired and the, and the applicant has no other remedy. And the third is a balance of convenience which must be in the favor of the applicant. That is, you, the court has to see that if, if I do not grant the injunction, what would be the hardship caused to the applicant? Would that hardship be greater than the hardship caused to the other party if I grant the injunction? If it is greater, the hardship that the applicant will be suffering, then the injunction will be granted. So these are the three points that the court has to keep in mind. So firstly, now moving on to the order itself and the rule one. So rule one says that the cases in which temporary injunctions may be granted. So in cases where there is a property in dispute, it is in the danger of being damaged, wasted, alienated, or wrongfully sold in execution of decree, or the defendant is threatening or intending to remove or dispose of the property with the view of defrauding his creditors, or he is threatening to dispossess the plaintiff or causing such injury in relation to the property in dispute. In those cases, court can grant a temporary injunction and restrain the other party till it, the disposal of the suit or till further orders. This was one where we saw three particular scenarios where temporary injunction is being granted. Then the next rule is where you are trying to restrain repetition or continuation of breach or any injury, whether this, uh, this, this regarding the fact whether compensation has been claimed or not at any time after the suit has been commenced before or after judgment, they may apply to the court for temporary injunction that uh, you restrain the person from continuing the breach of contract or whatever injury is resulting because of the same contract or relating to the same property or right. Now here, the, there will be uh, where the duration of injunction would be there, there an account would be kept, all security may be asked for, etc. can also be done. Now what is rule 2 we're telling? Next consequence that what will happen if you are disobeying or breaching that injunction? So whichever that court who had given that injunction or made that order or wherever this particular case was transferred may order that if the person is disobedi uh, disobeying or breaching that injunction, then his property may be attached and that person can also be detained in civil prison for a term not exceeding three months unless the court is directing their release. And whatever attachment is being done will not be enforced for more than one year. If it is continuing for beyond one year, then that sell that property, take the proceeds, grant compensation as deemed so, and then adjust the balance. Now, rule three is stating that ex parte injunctions are generally not given. The court will first give notice to the opposite party unless it feels that if I'm giving notice, etc., and delay will be caused when the very purpose of injunction will fail. Till then, the court will not proceed ex parte. 
if delay is a ground that you're not giving notice, court will put that in writing and the applicant will be required to deliver to the opposite party or send by registered posts immediately after the injunction is being granted, a copy of the injunction and affidavit in the support and all the copy of claims, copies, documents, etc. And on the next day or on the same day that the injunction has been granted, he has to file an affidavit that yes, I have made such and such service. Next rule 3A states that the court has to dispose of such applications within 30 days from date of grant of injunctions where it was proceeded with without notice to the opposite party. If somebody has come, then no, why didn't you hear me, etc. 30 days is the time limit. You can come here and, and object to it. Now, rule four is an important order where this injunction order is not permanent. It is a temporary injunction order. It can be discharged. It can be buried and set aside. Now, any party who is dissatisfied with it may apply to the court for the same. And if it, he is able to show that the party had made false or misleading statements in relation to a material particular, and if there was no notice given to the opposite party, then the court may vacate the injunction unless it records reasons that even though these things have happened, but it is necessary in the interest of justice that such vacation is not made. And if order has been passed after given opportunity, no modification will be made. So where you are allowing on the basis of false and misleading statements, etc., where the other party was not heard. If you were heard while the injunction was granted, unless there is a change in circumstances or the court feels so that it has caused several or un uh, unnecessary hardships, Till then, the court will not vacate that injunction. And Rule 5 is dealing with cooperation. What, how will the injunction bind on a corporation and its members? So this was under Order 39, the part dealing with temporary injunctions. Next, we move on to Order 39, the second part of Order 39, that is interlocutory orders, which is Rule 6 to 10. Now, Rule 6 says, says that, that the court has a power to order interim sale and for the same on the application of any party, but they may order the sale of any immovable property which it deems this thing's fit or may order its attachment if it is subject to speedy and natural delay or if it feels for any just or sufficient cause, it may also cause its sale. So here, the court can order interim sale when a party has uh, come that there's a particular there a movable property is there which was attached before the judgment and it is subject of a speedy and natural decay. So you sell and use the proceeds. Rule number seven is talking about detention, preservation, inspection of the subject matter. So on application of any of the parties for any or all other purposes that we have mentioned. They may authorize for, for preserving or inspecting the properties a person may be allowed to enter a building, etc. For taking samples or observations or making some experiments, take uh, and doing some experiments or taking full information evidence, they may allow so. And here, execution of process, whatever the provisions are there which allows a person to enter a property, etc. That provisions will apply here. Now, whatever applications, Rule 9 is stating that whatever... Uh, I think I've missed out the numbers. I'll check on the numbers. So here, the next rule would be stating that whatever applications are being made for such orders will have to be made by notice. And an application under Rule 6 or 7 can be made by the plaintiff any time after the institution of suit is done and by the defendant at any time after the appearance. And for every application, notice to the opposite party has to be given unless it is shown that it yeah, if notice is given, he caused delay and the purpose itself will fail. And uh, when uh, which is a situation, there may be a situation as the next rule stipulates that the party may be put in immediate possession of a land which is a subject matter for a suit. Here, the land is either paying revenue to the government or it is a tenure liable to sale. Now, whoever is in actual possession or in tenure of that particular land has neglected to pay the government revenue or the rent and such land is then ordered to be sold off. And any party who is claiming to have an interest in the same may upon payment of whatever other dues with or without security, he'll pay that and that will be the discretion of the court and then they'll put that person in immediate possession. And what will do, the court will do when it is passing its decree, it may award against the defaulter the amount that was paid by the person and all the interest as it deems fit. 
And rule number 10 states that deposit of money, etc. in court, well, if the subject matter is a money or certain deliverable, and the party is admitting that he's holding it in a capacity or for trustee for another party or it is belonging to another party, then the court may order that you come and deposit the same in court or you deliver it to such person with or without security as per the description of the court. And this order, whether, whether you are granting or refusing an interlocutory order, there that is also a subject of appeal under section 96.3. Now, as I had said, you can go through arrest before judgment, order 38, rule 1 to 4. What are the grounds where such arrest will be done is given under rule 1. Security provisions are given in the rest of the orders, uh, arrest of these uh, rules. Then attachment, there rule 5 is giving the grounds where attachment before judgment will be done. You can go through the other rules also. Section 95 is a, a section where compensation for arrest, attachment, injunction on insufficient grounds have been given. Then how that person will be compensated, that is dealt under section 95. What would be the limits, etc. Then receiver is given under order 40. Now, as we see that this term is also not defined, but it can mean an indifferent person between parties to a cause who was appointed by the court to receive and preserve the property or the fund in a litigation which was pending and where the court feels that none of the parties should hold it. So it is a person who is having no concern with the proceedings as such. He is appointed by the court. He will reserve, receive and preserve all the property, all the money that is there while the litigation is pending and it's done in such an appointment is done in situations where the court feels that no other party should be holding it. Now rule one to four, as you can see here, what deals with the specific uh, grounds like rule one, appointment of receiver, two, remuneration, three, about its duties, four is, four is, uh, three is rights, I suppose, rights of a receiver, then four is the duties. Then you can also go through payment in court, order 24, and security for cost, order 25. So this in general that we write right now, commissions, injunctions, uh, temporary injunctions, interlocutory orders, and uh, arrest and attachment before judgment, receiver, security for cost, and payment in court, are the different kinds of interim orders that are dealt under the court. These become important as we see to necessary to do justice in a case as most as uh, it might not be possible that it might be necessary at that point of time that the court has to pass an order or if the court ignores to do so such injustice might be caused so this is why such interim orders provision has been given. So till now today we have covered interest Course. Then we moved on to discovery, inspection, and production of documents, where we were seeing the interrogatories, production of documents, which saw about admissions. We went to about affidavits. Then we came on to interim orders. We saw commissions. We saw temporary injunctions. Uh, then we saw interlocutory orders. And uh, we saw receivers, etc., etc. Now, today's plan was to move forward to the next topic, that is. Uh, um, that is withdrawal and compromise of suits and the effects of death, marriage and insolvency on suits. But I think it has become a quite a long lecture. So that, that portion I might include in another lecture or I might upload a part two of the same lecture today itself. I'll see what to do about that. I feel for today, I hope whatever we have covered, discovery part or the interim orders part is clear. Please understand that the discovery part that we have covered is when we are seeing discovery production inspection is important for CPC when we are seeing that the pleadings are not enough, all material particulars have not come on front. That is why we are resorting to the same. That is why we are resorting to uh, admissions or affidavits. And for interim orders, we are feeling that there is a need that at this point of time, the court feels necessary or just or equitable that such, such certain reliefs should be given. There is a need that you need to examine certain persons or you should to cause a partition or to performing a ministerial act. So it is ordering a commission to do so, or it is granting a temporary injunction based on the three factors of a uh, prima facie case, uh, balance of convenience and uh, balance of convenience and uh, 
and irreparable injury. Then you saw the certain situations when they were being granted. Then we went on to when uh, to the interlocutory orders where the court had the power to order interim sale or detaining or preserving inspection of a particular subject matter. Then what has to be done that applications has to be made by notice a person can be put into immediate possession of a land and the deposit of money etc and then you have seen there were certain things that i did not go through it but i did have put uh, um, pointers of important rules that you might rules and orders that you should go through like arrest for judgment attachment for judgment you are uh, in when you're reading so it's not necessary to go through each and every point most important points here would be what are the grounds when arrest before judgment or attachment before judgment is being done uh, is there any specific provision that is there given under the rules then under a receiver when he is appointed what are the rights and duties of a receiver etc and then payment in court and security for cause. So this was all about the interim, in the interim process, what is taking place. Now withdrawal and compromise, etc., are also important concepts, which I wanted to cover today, but I think it will become too long for today's video. So I, I'm skipping that for today, but I hope the, uh, the rationale behind including such provisions is understood. Till last class, this was the reason last class I, cranked up first hearing uh, judgment and decree uh, judgment and decree trial together so that you can understand that okay if everything is in order then by judgment and decree it is coming to a conclusion obviously execution is also there but in a sense suits are getting completed there but it is not always the case that everything will be there in proper order that is why we have dealt with today's class where we are seeing that Apart from it, we also dealt with interest and cost and that summons part that I uh, mentioned about. Please ensure that the summons part, please read it with a relevant order. And interest and cost should be read with judgment and decree. I hope today's class is fine and you have understood all the concepts. I hope it did not get too boring, too repetitive. I did not make the in the nutshell part for today because I felt it would take me a lot more time. Uh, but when, uh, but uh, I hope you you have been able to understand that you might, by now you might have been able to understand that how I make the inner nutshell part for each of the orders. You can also make it on your own. So this is for, uh, it for today's class. I hope you have liked the same. If there's any uh, error in the content or any, uh, otherwise, please let me know. I would try and remove that. And if you want, we can do the leftover orders here that I have mentioned. I've just briefly mentioned. If you want, we can cover it in another class if you want so. And, and for the remaining topics for today, I will try and see if I can upload them today itself. And so that, that's all from my side. Thank you.